la 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 mi 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 figaro 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 Linda get off your horse Linda I wasn't saying anything what volume I wasn't saying anything Linda get off that horse figaro 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 all right, guys. Welcome, everybody. Good to see you. <clears throat> Good to see you, guys. Linda, I miss me, too. Guys, do what I normally ask of you guys. Number one, begin by being prayed up. Pray. We need prayers. I need your prayers. I truly do need your prayers. Ask the Spirit to fill us. Ask the Spirit to guide us. Ask the Spirit to purify, cleanse, wash us. And the blood of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ, <clears throat> ask the Holy Spirit to grant me the health I need, self-control, self-restraint, <clears throat> self-discipline. Please, we need the Holy Spirit. We need to depend on the Spirit, cling to the Spirit, cleave to the Spirit, hope in the Spirit, trust in the Spirit, love the Holy Spirit by His power. So pray, especially uh, these have been a couple of rough days. You guys know when I have a cheat day, it doesn't go well with me. I try to have a cheat day so I can stay tight by the power of the Holy Spirit as he gives me perfect self-control so I can keep this path as he empowers me to be victorious over my flesh. In Jesus' name, give me victory over food addiction and other sinful passions. But when those days come, because my body is used to eating clean, my body shuts down. So I need energy. So do pray. I need energy. So do be prayed up. Ask the Holy Spirit to fill us, to fill me, to energize me, to reinvigorate me, to rejuvenate me, to replenish me. Because Joseph Smith was like Muhammad, a bastard, because Muhammad raped women. Muhammad prostituted women, treated women like whores, beat women. And his Satan, Allah, the same Satan that inspired Joseph Smith, allowed men, according to his filthy trash book the quran which is worse than toilet paper to beat women to molest children pedophilia chapter 65 verse 4 to rape women like unapologetic warriors mother treat them like whores right even married women because muhammad was a bastard <clears throat> his god was satan the same spirit that inspired muhammad so the quran is worse than trash it's worse than toilet paper it's worse than my toilet. The urine in my toilet and the crap of animals better than the Quran and Muhammad's God. And I don't mean to disrespect toilets, dogs. I don't mean to disrespect <clears throat> trash, urine, because all of that is better than Muhammad, better than Muhammad's God, Allah. A book that teaches people to rape women, even married women, to treat women like unapologetic mother, unapologetic warrior's mother, sister, wife, daughter, as whores, prostitute them, beat them like whores, chapter 4, verse 34, the Quran, and I'm not lying, chapter 4, verse 24, chapter 4, verse 34, and also pedophilia, to take his young sister, who's six or nine, and molest her in the name of Muhammad Satan, 64 verse, 65, verse 4. So we're going to be talking about a prophet similar to Muhammad, in many ways, just as evil, if not more so even though Muhammad is on a whole nother level. So guys, welcome. Do pray. The Spirit fills me. The Holy Spirit guides me and guides you. The Holy Spirit constrains us. The Holy Spirit grants us perfect self-control, self-restraint, not to be politically correct, not to tickle ears, not to be crowd pleasers, but not to sin in our anger and to hate Satan with perfect hatred, resist Satan with perfect resistance and submit to the Lord Jesus Christ with perfect submission. And to be cleansed, purified, washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, filled with the Holy Spirit, to delight Abba Father, to delight the Lord Jesus, the Father's heart who became flesh, delight the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name, and to hate all these satanic bastards, sons of the devil, these spiritual whores, these demons who are burning in hell, starting with Muhammad in Jesus' name. Secondly, do hit the like button, share the link on your social media platforms, and invite folks, invite folks to join the stream. If you believe God is using me in spite of our imperfections, our sins, our weaknesses, that God is still using me, using you to glorify Jesus Christ as he perfects us and sanctifies us to become more like Jesus, then invite folks 
hit the like button. And once the class begins, please, no side talks, no side discussions, no <clears throat> tangents, no pontificating. You're here to learn, and you're here to ask the Holy Spirit to come to the forefront. The Lord Jesus increase, we decrease, I disappear, and the Holy Spirit will magnify the Lord Jesus Christ by using human vessels. And I pray I'm one of them and not self-deluded. And may the Holy Spirit control my tongue, the words of my tongue in my mouth, and guard my tongue in my mouth to never betray or deny or blaspheme, shame, or disown the Lord Jesus Christ. So you guys, please observe those rules. All right. Anyway, so everyone there? With me there? Because we got a lot to talk about. Let's ask the Lord to show up and bless and reinvigorate, rejuvenate, replenish, regenerate, revive us. With the life from the Holy Spirit, strength from the Holy Spirit, vigor and passion from the Holy Spirit to conform to the image of our God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, to grant us the holy flesh of Jesus Christ and the precious blood of Jesus Christ for our food, for our salvation, redemption, our holiness, purification, and our healing because the flesh of Jesus is real food and the blood of Jesus Christ is real <clears throat> drink. And that's the words of our Lord Jesus. Read John 6, start reading 27 all the way to 58. And that's what our Lord says. So let's begin. And the Lord be glorified and magnified. And may he beatify us with the beauty of Jesus Christ, the holiness of Jesus Christ, the purity of Jesus Christ, the love, compassion, mercy, and patience of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, <clears throat> died and was buried. He descended to hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended to heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence, from there, he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of body and life everlasting. Amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespasses against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, both now and forever and to ages of ages. In the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name, we pray. Abba, Father, we need you. We depend on you. Give us the power and the strength from the Holy Spirit to love you perfectly, to fear you perfectly, to obey you perfectly, to worship you perfectly, to cling to you perfectly, to trust in you perfectly, to love, to trust, to cling in, to your Son, <clears throat> the Lord Jesus, to love, to trust, and to cling to your Holy Spirit by your power. Feed us the holy flesh of the Lord Jesus Christ. Grant us the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Guard our tongues, Father. Control our tongues. Control our mouths. Guard our mouths. Control every word that comes out of our mouths by your infinite power that no wicked, vile, filthy, blasphemous, idolatrous word will ever come out of our tongues, whether voluntarily or involuntarily, but that you'll sanctify us. Flood us in your living waters, Holy Spirit. Flood us in the blood of the Lamb, our God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. You are the God and Father, our God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ the virgin-born son of Mary, the son of David, <clears throat> the son of Abraham, your heart, the eternal love of the Spirit. May your son increase in us, Father. May he shine in and through us by his glorious, beautiful light, radiating in and through us, destroying the darkness in us and around us, being cleansed, washed, purified in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Save us from our sinful passions. Save us from our lusts. Save us from our laziness, our slothfulness. Save us from pride and arrogance. Save us from lack of humility, humbleness. Save us from impatience and jealousy and envy and slander and covetousness and all vices, sexual immorality, whatever it is, Abba, Father. Save us from our flesh. Crucify our flesh. Destroy the fruits of our flesh. Fill us with fruit from the Holy Spirit. Power, self-control, self-restraint from your Holy Spirit. And Abba, Father, whatever sins that may be unique to us that we struggle with, give us perfect victory to overcome by the blood of the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, to hate Satan and resist him with perfect resistance, submitting to the Lord Jesus and obeying the Lord Jesus Christ 
not for the praise of men, but to show ourselves that we love the Lord Jesus and we belong to you, Father. We belong to your son, the Lord Jesus. We belong to Holy Spirit. May he increase in all of us, in our loved ones, in my daughters, their mothers, sit and thrown upon their hearts, the hearts of our loved ones, my daughters, their mother, in our hearts, Father, our hearts being his everlasting throne. We need you, Father. You don't need us. We need the Lord Jesus. He doesn't need us. We need your Holy Spirit. He doesn't need us. Guard my mouth. Save me from stammering. Save me from stuttering. Save me from error. Save me from misinformation. Save me from confusion. And perfect the gifts you've given us to use them lawfully, to use them for the glory of our God and Savior, Lord Jesus Christ, to use them unselfishly, to build one another and not for selfish gain. The store of lust of fame, fortune, status, do it for the glory of your name, Father, for the glory of the Lord Jesus, for the glory of the Holy Spirit. Enable me to recall the scriptures perfectly. Enable me to interpret scriptures perfectly. Enable me to recall the facts of Mormonism perfectly to be completely accurate and correct any mistakes on the spot and empower us not just to know your word, to obey your word, Father, to live out your word, to love your word, to proclaim your word even unto death without shame or fear and never, never fall into any scandal. We need you, Father. We need the Lord Jesus. We need the Holy Spirit. Bless the internet connection, the audio and visual qualities <clears throat> and strengthen my throat with perfect health and vigor. Make my voice full of passion and power to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ without shame or compromise and silence these filthy, wicked dogs, these spiritual bastards who blaspheme the Lord Jesus, crush their mouths and use us as lions to eat them up spiritually and not to fear their threats for the glory of your name, for the glory of the name of the Lord Jesus, for the glory of the name of your Holy Spirit. And we trust your Holy Spirit. We cling to your Holy Spirit. We depend on your Holy Spirit to take over. Beatify us, Lord, and help me, Lord, in my weaknesses to stay tight, self-discipline, the health that I need to stay healthy, and the holiness to delight your heart. And we say again, as the body of Jesus Christ, give us the power to love you perfectly because we fail and we want to love you perfectly. We want to love the Lord Jesus Christ perfectly. We want to love your Holy Spirit perfectly and die glorifying you and never shaming you. So bless this session. And I pray I'm not a nuisance to my neighbors. Have your way, Father. Have your way, Lord Jesus. Have your way, Holy Spirit. As we expose these cults, these demons, whether Muhammad, that filthy bastard, spiritual whore burning in hell, praise you for crushing that demon, that spiritual whore in hell. Save Muslims from him, Father. Save Muslims from him, Lord Jesus. Save Muslims from him, Holy Spirit. And now use me by the power of your might to show Mormons that Joseph Smith was no better. So they will escape the blasphemous teachings of Joseph Smith and the church will be protected against these antichrists. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, of the Holy Spirit, in the name of our God and Savior, Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. Bring them, Lord, and grant me contentment. Bring them in Jesus' almighty name. Father, Holy Spirit. Watch my God. I'm saying, okay, Lord Jesus Christ. Guys, good to see you. It's been a while. Good to see you. I guess the demons are manifesting. Who's son of Aram? Son of Aram is one of our mods, isn't he? He's a brother in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's a mod. But I saw Miriam and someone else mentioning son of Aram. Almost like he was spewing heresy, right? May the Lord, my God, Father, Spirit, help me to stay tight and grant me perfect self-control, not to lose this victory, pleading the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, and I follow this Holy Spirit. I need to shave, guys, and I need to get back on my routine by the power of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, let me shake the Father, Spirit. Watch me again. Let's say, okay, Lord Jesus Christ. So what happened? Uh, was someone... No. Yeah, because son of Aram is the brother of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's one of my mods, and he loves the triune God, the Father, the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit. But earlier I saw a comment by Miriam. She kind of confused me. She was saying Jesus created all things, son of Aram, with a question mark. I don't know why. Or is there someone else with that name? I'm kind of baffled. Can someone help me here? Is that our precious sister, Coco? Good to see you, Coco. It's been a while. Is that hot Coco? Hot chocolate? I drink black coffee. <laughs> anyway, may the Lord be out of me. Boy, if looks could kill and if being ugly was a sin, David would be the greatest sinner next to apostate prophets. So are we ready? Are we ready? Folks, when class begins, you need to focus. Do not get into side discussions. Don't let the demons manifest. Muzzle them as the Lord Jesus Christ muzzled Muhammad and damned him to hell. We need to begin. Are we ready? I have posted two links to material relevant to this topic 
but I'm going to be producing more posts where I'm going to quote from the official sources of the Mormon church. Now, by the way, they do not like to be called Mormons anymore. Okay. They do not like to be called Mormons anymore. Okay. Now, guys, help me to help you focus. Right. Do not go into side tangents because you got the demons manifesting, these spiritual whores. Well, because their mothers were dishonored, they want to now dishonor the blessed mother of our God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. I'm going to be publishing if the Lord Jesus Christ wills. If the Holy Spirit is pleased to use me and give me the holiness to delight the, the Lord Jesus Christ, obedience to be a doer of the word of our God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the health that I need and the discipline I need, I will be posting articles where I quote from official Mormon sources because this is another religion I need to tackle. Not that I'm an expert, but I'm learning, and I'm trusting the Holy Spirit to perfect my understanding, to actually understand what they believe, and show why their teachings are from the pit of hell. Just to let you know what I'll be referencing today. This right here, do you see it here? Do you see it? Gospel fundamentals. you see it here? I need to shave, guys. When I don't shave, I look older. This is from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Okay? They don't like to be called Mormons anymore. Okay? They don't like to be called Mormons anymore. They prefer that you call them the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints or the Latter-day Saints. This book was recommended to me by one of the employees at a Mormon bookstore, Deseret. I did not know that these bookstores called Deseret, D-E-S-E-R-E-T, are Mormon bookstores. They're Mormon bookstores. So when I visited a Mormon bookstore a couple of weeks ago, I asked the employee, it was a woman, I want a book, an authoritative book, a book that is accurate and approved by your church that delineates your beliefs. So that when I read that book and I quote from that book, I won't have a Mormon tell me that's not official Mormon teaching. She told me to get this. She told me to get this. She recommended this. Okay, guys, are you listening? Class has begun. She told me to get this. Okay? She recommended this. So, guys, I want to make sure. I'm going to repeat myself three to four times because we are creatures of repetition. We need to hear something repetitively. Right until it becomes second nature by the power of our God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, Muhammad's destroyer and judge, who damned that filthy maggot whore Muhammad in hell. Glory to the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit, the one true God who lives. So I'm glad she did. She told me to get this book. So Mormons, if you're watching, this was recommended to me by a member of your church working at your bookstore, Desert, and it's a chain. You'll find them all over. And she told me, if you want to know official Mormon teaching, get this. And the title is Gospel Fundamentals. Okay. I also picked this up from the bookstore. They have an Old Testament study guide. Old Testament study guide, start to finish. The Old Testament study guide, start to finish, supplied with notes Right, and the general editor is Thomas R. Valera. Okay, so you again, I want to see if there's going to be. Let me read this here. Yeah, I want to find where it's going to tell you, start to finish. Anyway, now many of you may not know this, but the Mormon church distributes and endorses the authorized King James Version of the Holy Bible. The Mormons, like Muslims, believe the Bible is corrupt and that the Bible needs, in the case of Muslims, Muhammad, to explain it, interpret it. case of the Mormon church, you need Joseph Smith and the prophets that God has raised up to properly interpret 
and properly translate the Bible. Are you with me there? So the Mormon will tell you that the Bible is accurate insofar as it's properly translated and interpreted. And with that said, they endorse the authorized King James Version of the Bible. That's the only translation they distribute. And even here in their Old Testament study guide, they're using the King James Version. And if you're wondering why, it's because at that time when Joseph Smith flourished, the chief English translation of the Holy Bible for English-speaking Christians was the authorized King James Version, which is why in the Book of Mormon, you will find that when the Bible is being cited, it's the King James Version rendering of those verses. And since to them, Joseph Smith is a prophet, and since Joseph Smith used the King James Bible, then that's the Bible that they use, endorse, distribute, and explain, interpret, and correct. Everyone with me there? As I'm trusting the Holy Spirit to guide me into all truth, save me from error, please, Holy Spirit, to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. So are you with me there? So this is why, if you get this book, watch here. They have, right here, they actually reproduced the letter of the King James translators to King James who authorized the translation. They even have reproduced it here. Do you see it? Look what it says here, right? To the most high and mighty Prince James, by the grace of God, King of Great Britain, France, and Ireland, defender of the faith, the translators of the Bible, which grace, mercy, and peace, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So they actually reproduced their letter that they wrote at the commencement of their translation. And if you're not aware of it, the King James translation was translated by 54 of the most eminent, em eminent, right? E M I N E N T, not imminent, eminent, most knowledgeable scholars of the Holy Bible. 54 of the most learned men of the church, clergy, who knew biblical languages such as Arabic, Latin, Aramaic, Syriac, <clears throat> Greek. 54. So they reproduced the letter. Now, these are the two sources I'll be using for this session. And in subsequent sessions, I'll be using these sources and some other sources produced by the Mormons, endorsed by the Mormons, sources they deem to be authoritative. So everyone with me? This here, Gospel Fundamentals, and this here. So far with me, are you learning? Class has begun. Help me to help you focus and pray the Holy Spirit fill me to fill you for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ, right? Now with that said, before I then venture into some of the things they teach, it is vitally important for you to remember, and I'm going to give you sources to confirm. The original authorized King James Version of 1611 included the Deuterocanonicals called the Apocrypha. Are you aware of it? Are you aware? This is an historical fact. The original King James Version of the Bible not only translated the 39 Old Testament books, and the 27 New Testament books, but they also translated the Deuterocanonicals called by Protestants Apocrypha, and it was part of the 1611 edition, and it was a part of all King James Version Bibles up until the 1800s. And here it is, the official English translation of the Apocrypha by the King James translators. Do you see it? And you can read it online. You see it? KJV Apocrypha. You see it? Cambridge University Press. Apocrypha. Apocrypha. Authorized King James Version. Authorized King James Version. Okay? 
Now, I had mentioned these works in previous sessions, but I'm going to mention them again. Let me mention them again, all right? Let me show you. One second. Hold on. This is for the Catholics, the Orthodox, the Coptics, and the Assyrian Church of the East. Are you aware that you can get this two-volume set, okay, this two-volume set of the King James Version, of the King James Version with the Deuterocanonicals for Catholics, Volume 1, Volume 2, okay? Here, let me show you now. So this is all preparing the foundation, laying the groundwork. Here you go. The King James Bible for who? For who? For Catholics. With the Deuterocanonical books and the prayer of Manassas, 1st Esdras and 2nd Esdras, Volume 1. Okay? Genesis to Ecclesiasticus. Okay? Volume 2. You with me there? Watch here. The King James Bible for Catholics, Deuterocanonicals and the Prayer of Manassas, First and Esther, Second Esther, Volume Two. Watch here. Isaiah to Revelation, and you see the publishing, Welsingham Publishing. There you go, folks. Don't think the King James Bible is only for Protestants, and don't think that the King James Bible rejected the Deuterocanonicals. It did not. It did not. It was in the 19th century, 1800s, around 1880s AD, that Bible societies removed, expunged the Deuterocanonicals from the King James. But from 1611 all the way unto the 1880s. Let me repeat. Listen, guys, and I'm going to quote to you from a Protestant theologian and professor to prove my point. Okay, from the 16th, from 1611 up until the 1880s, the Deuterocanonical Apocrypha was part of the King James Bible, and it was only expunged mm -hmm. and removed from subsequent printings of the King James in the 1880s. I used to think it was 1830s, but again, my memory needs to be perfected by the power of the Holy Spirit. But it was 18, and I'm going to read that for you. So let me put this out on uh, the side. Guys, you need to study. Be serious students of the Bible, of the Holy Spirit, and pray for me. The Holy Spirit will use me and fill me and sanctify me to truly be a holy, obedient, worshipful, spirit-filled slave of the Lord Jesus Christ and not to be a hypocrite. And the more he teaches me, the more I'll share with you. Okay, now, Michael F. Byrd. Who is Michael F. Byrd? Okay, who is he? He's not Catholic. He's not Orthodox. Let me read you his credentials. Michael F. Bird is an academic dean and lecturer in theology at Ridley College in Melbourne, Australia. He is the author of more than a dozen books, including What Christians Ought to Believe, an evangelical theology. He's an evangelical Protestant professor. He also runs a popular theological studies blog called Ewan Galeon and can be followed on Twitter at M. Bird 12, okay? This is published by Zondervan, an evangelical publishing company, okay? What does he say about the Apocrypha and the King James? Are you ready? Seven things I wish Christians knew about the Bible. Seven things I wish Christians knew about the Bible, okay? So let's go. You ready? Let me read what he says about the importance of the Apocrypha. Pages 14 to 17, okay? Pages 14 to 17. This is all preparatory for what's to come because you're going to see why it's important. Preparatory for what's to come. Okay, let's read. While the Apocrypha has been read and studied throughout church history, okay, guys, give me your ears. Lend me your ears. Let the Holy Spirit speak to us. Did you hear what he said? While the Apocrypha has been read and study throughout church history. Christ, Christian churches differ among themselves when it comes to the status and extent of the Apocrypha. On the status and order of these books in the Bible, 
Protestants call these books apocrypha and ordinarily place them between the Old and New Testaments. Now watch what he says about the English translations of the Bible before the King James, the authorized version. Look what he says, okay? At least in the Tyndale, Matthew's Bible, the Great Bible, the Bishop's Bible, the Geneva Bible, and the King James Bible. Did you catch it? The English translations before the King James included the Apocrypha between the Old and New Testaments. Did you guys catch it? You hear what he said? All right. You hear what he said? Now watch here. Watch here. Let me read it again. <clears throat> On the status and order of these books in the Bible, Protestants call these books Apocrypha and ordinarily place them between the Old and New Testaments, at least in the Tyndale Matthews Bible, the Great Bible, the Bishop's Bible, the Geneva Bible, which was the Bible of the Puritans, and the King James Bible. Fun fact, the King James Version, KJV, originally included the Old Testament, New Testament, and Apocrypha, and it was not until the 1880s that Bible societies began to admit the Apocrypha from printings of the King James Version. Did you hear that? Okay. Let me read that part again. Fun fact, Protestants. Okay. The King James Version, KJV, originally included the Old Testament, New Testament, and Apocrypha. And it was not until the 1880s the Bible societies began to admit the Apocrypha from the printings of the King James Version, KJV. See, it's right here. Right there. You see, I got it on the line. You see it? Okay. Now, let me continue reading. Even today, many Bibles, like the English Standard Version and Common English Bible, include the Apocrypha in some printings. The reading of the Ap Apocrypha was encouraged was encouraged <clears throat> by protestant denominations not because the apocrypha should be used in preaching or in the establishment of christian doctrine it's not about the protestant view but because they were received to be read for the advancement and furtherance of the knowledge of history and for the instruction of godly manners geneva bible quoting geneva bible and for instruction in life and manners anglican 39 articles so he's quoting the Geneva Bible and the Anglican 39 Articles of Faith. In contrast, Catholics recognize them as deuterocanonical, a second canonical collection, not merely useful, but God-given and authoritative. The Greek Orthodox Church recognized the Old Testament and Apocrypha, but doesn't divide them up into those two categories, and they simply consider them to be, and he gives a Greek word, anagignoskomina. Ana mina, meaning books to be read. Okay? To make things ever more confusing, pay attention. This is a Protestant scholar. There are disagreements on what books should be in the Apocrypha. Alas, the Protestant Apocrypha, the Catholic Deuterocan Deuterocanonicals, and the Greek Orthodox, Ana mina, do not all contain the same set of writings, but that doesn't clarify things because they do include <clears throat> many, if not most, of the same deuterocanonical works. For example, in the King James, the Catholic edition, and the Greek Orthodox, you'll find 1st and 2nd Maccabees. You'll find Tobit, Wisdom of Solomon, Sirach, right? <clears throat> so those you will find, they hold in common. But anyway, let me continue. If that were not complicated enough, consider this. The Slavonic Bible, a literary forebear of the Russian Synodal version, the standard Russian Orthodox Bible, has slight variations from the Greek Orthodox Bible in terms of which apocryphal books it includes. Now, this is the one that's the doozy, the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. Watch this. Somewhat more exotic. The Ethiopian Orthodox Church. Okay. Ethiopian Orthodox Church includes in its Old Testament the entire Hebrew canon and Apocrypha 
but also adds in pseudepigraphical, pseudepigraphical writings, writings falsely attributed to someone, texts falsely or fictitiously attributed to ancient figures such as Jubilees, First Enoch, they include Enoch, and for Baruch, who was the scribe of Jeremiah, while rejecting books like First and Second Maccabees. The Ethiopic, Ethiopic New Testament includes the standard 27 books, but adds many other books related to church orders, such as the Didaskalia, which is different than the Didache, Didachi, and the Book of the Covenant, giving them a canon with a massive 81 books. So the Ethiopian Orthodox Church has a total of any 81 books in their canon. Sorry, guys, I look a little older. I got to trim and shave. Don't worry. Later on, I'm going to look like a young, handsome stud. Ow! Ow, 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 ow. All right, anyway. Okay, now let's continue. So when someone talks about the biblical canon, you almost have to ask, which one? Now look what he says here. Advice for you Protestants. Advice for you Protestants right here. See it? Here's the advice right here. Okay. Look what he says. He's a Protestant. Let me be clear. The Christians should read the Apocrypha. I'm going to repeat it two more times. Let me be clear. Christians should read the Apocrypha. And he puts an exclamation mark. If you want to understand the historical period between Malachi and Matthew, then you should make a concerted effort to read the history Wisdom literature and apocalyptic hopes contained in this body of writings. The books called by us, because he's a Protestant, Apocrypha, were widely read and used by Christians in the early centuries. See it? Don't let James White tell you otherwise. Were widely read and used by Christians in the early centuries and only gradually were divided away from the Old and New Testaments. The Apocrypha provides a glimpse into the world, into the world of Second Temple Judaism, right? Let me do this one second. Second Temple Judaism. And the backdrop to the New Testament period. So Tole Lege, take up and read. Take up and read. You caught it? So this was necessary, necessary background information. Now let me read another section. So all of you students of the Bible, get this small book. Get this small book. And we're going to begin. But this is necessary background information. And this is a necessary foundation. Okay? But let me read what he says about the brief history of the English Bible. Pages 29, 31, and we're going to begin. We're going to begin with... Mormonism. Okay. We're going to begin with Mormonism. But I needed to give you this background. Why? You're going to see why. You're going to see why the Deuterocanonicals are important. There is a statement. In fact, here in my article, there is a plain, explicit statement in 2 Maccabees, chapter 7, 28, that God created the universe. God created the universe from nothing. That's going to be important because in Mormonism, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit did not create from nothing ex nihilo because to them, God the Father was a man already existing in a material world universe on a specific planet who then became a God and sired children with his wife, his spirit wife, and his first child was Jesus. We're going to see that. And then had Jesus, and they say, make the earth, but not create it from nothing because Jesus took already existing matter and fashioned that matter into the world because Mormons deny creation ex nihilo, creation from nothing. They deny that. Are you with me? Let me repeat. Mormons do not believe the Father Elohim, Jesus Jehovah, created the creation from nothing 
brought creation into being from nothing, which is called creation ex nihilo, from nothing. They believe that God the Father was a man who attained godhood and has spirit children that he sired with his spirit wife. And the first one was Jesus. And we're going to get to that, I promise. And then he assigned to Jesus the role who in his pre-human existence was called Jehovah to make the earth not create it from nothing, but make it from pre-existing matter. Okay. In the Deuterocanonicals, and here's my article on this. Here it is. It's in the description box, but here's the title. Notes for Mormon Debate. These are the notes I gathered for the debate with Kwaku that never happened because he didn't last more than 20 minutes. In 2 Maccabees 7, 28, you find this amazing statement. I beg you, child, to look at heaven and earth, see that everything that is in them and know that God made these things from nothing and created humankind in the same way. An explicit statement. This is the clearest, most unambiguous statement you'll find in the Bible that God created ex nihilo. 2 Maccabees 7, 28 from the Common English Bible. Focus, Miriam. Focus, please. Don't distract Dina. I know you're a good sister. All of you are. Just focus. She listens. She doesn't need to comment. She's learning. And know that God made these things from nothing and created humankind in the same way. Now, let's read it from the English translation of 2 Maccabees from the, from the King James Bible. From the King James Bible. And you can read the King James Bible's Translation of Apocrypha Online. Here's the link. Here's the link to 2 Maccabees 728 from the King James Translation. It's in that paper. Here it is. So if you click there, here's the link. It takes you to 2 Maccabees 728, rendered by the King James translators. And that's the site where you're going to find the entire English rendering of the Apocrypha done by the King James translators in 1611 online for free. Now, notice how they rendered it. Here it is, 728. I beseech thee, my son, look upon the heaven and earth and all that is therein and consider that God made, made them of things that were not. Even in the Elizabethan English, you can see. He made what you see by things that are not. He didn't refashion existing matter. He produced creation from nothing. Okay, is that clear? We got it so far? So we can move on now? See why the Deuterocanonicals are important? Because if you quote verses from the New Testament and the Hebrew Bible, they will argue with you that the Hebrew and the mm -hmm. Greek do not mean that the creation was made ex nihilo out of nothing. And they'll quote scholars who are liberal to say, Genesis 1-1 is not talking about creation ex nihilo. And if you don't believe me, listen to that discussion I had with that Mormon on my YouTube channel. He even pretty much tried to argue against me that the verses that are cited from the Greek New Testament and the Hebrew Old Testament that rejects the Deuterocanonicals do not teach creation from ex nihilo. But then I nailed him with 2 Maccabees 7-28. I quoted 2 Maccabees 7.28 because he couldn't get around that. But sadly, because Joseph Smith came at a time where the Bibles were now excising the Deuterocanonicals from the King James Version, this is why you find in the Mormon Church, the King James Version they endorse is the one without the Apocrypha Deuterocanonicals. Everyone so far with me? Now let's read a little bit about the history of the English Bible, and then we begin. So far with me, guys? Are you learning about this cult as I'm learning too? Okay, let's read. A brief history of the English Bible, pages 29 and 31. Watch here, guys. Catholics, this is going to make you happy. Catholics is going to make you happy, okay? 
During the Middle Ages, Catholics, you're going to get happy now. During the Middle Ages, the Latin Vulgate was the Bible of the English church. Did you hear that, guys? Protestants, did you hear that? And Protestants, you need to reflect on that. If the Catholic church is a false church, a corrupt church, an apostate church, up until the Reformation, where could you find the church of Jesus Christ and true believers in the West? If you're saying the Catholic Church, Antichrist, Pope is Antichrist and a corrupt church, then up until the Reformation, where was the Church of Jesus Christ in the West? You see? Does, during the Middle Ages, the Latin Vulgate was the Bible of the English Church. Okay? Despite the existence of a few fragments here and there, there was no English translation of the Bible in the common language. But in the 1380s, the Oxford professor, <clears throat> John Wyc Wycliffe, began to produce an English translation of the Vulgate. An English translation of what? The Vulgate, because that's all they had at that time, because that was the official Bible of the Western Church, the Vulgate. That was initially, originally translated, <clears throat> collated, compiled, produced by Jerome. Okay. Wycliffe was declared a heretic by the Roman Catholic Church. Sadly, we do have people that are overzealous in all churches. And not everything a particular bishop or priest or church does is necessarily pleasing to God. Even Catholics would admit that. Right? Wycliffe was declared a heretic by the Roman Catholic Church, but his followers, known as Lollards, kept his teachings and translation alive in an underground movement despite English translations being banned by Henry IV in 1401. Things came to a head when Erasmus of Rotterdam published his first edition of a parallel Latin Greek New Testament in 1516, the Novum Testamentum based on a limited number <clears throat> of medieval Greek manuscripts that he had access to. Not only was this book an original edition of the Greek New Testament, but it was reproduced in large numbers <clears throat> due to the invention of the printing press. When God blessed us with the creation of the printing press, then the Bible could be mass produced in the thousands and today in the millions so that the Bible could be accessible. But now notice God's timing. Guys, notice God's wisdom, sovereign timing. When do you find printed editions of the Greek New Testament being collated? Right around the time of the printing press, making mass copies, mass production of the Bible a reality. Whereas prior to that, to make a copy of the book of the Bible would be too expensive and would take too much time. So notice how God is working in creation, guiding his church to those right set of manuscripts to copy from and preserve, so that when mankind had the ability to mass produce Bibles, that's when you see all of this coming together to bring about the fruition of a Bible for English-speaking Christians and people in various languages. All right. Veronique says you can thank the Catholic for the printing press too. All right, let's go. Let's keep reading, okay? <clears throat> but it was reproduced in large numbers due to the invention of the printing press. Erasmus's Novum Testamentum highlighted the disparities between the Greek and Latin versions of the New Testament, which is to be expected because we translate from one language into another and use various Greek copies. There'll be variant readings. That's just the reality of hand copies, right? Okay, Muslims, so shut your mouths. <clears throat> Which further furthered the case for religious reform. Erasmus's Novum Testamentum went through five editions over the next 20 years, with each edition attempting to improve the text when new manuscripts were drawn to his attention. <clears throat> the third edition of 1522 served as the basis 
for William Tyndale's illegal and contraband English translation of the New Testament in 1526. And I'm going to comment on that in a minute. A translation of the Old Testament in English was completed by Miles Coverdale based on Tyndale's unfinished work, Coverdale's own translation of the Vulgate, and Luther's German Bible in 1535. Thus, it was in 1535 that England finally had a complete copy of the Old and New Testaments in English. When? 1535. Shortly after 1537, John Rogers produced his own translation of the Old and New Testaments in English, largely dependent upon the work of Tyndale and Cover Coverdale, called the Matthew Bible, because Rogers wrote under the pseudonym, false name, Thomas Matthew. Then in 1539, Archbishop Thomas Cranmer commissioned Coverdale to produce the Great Bible, which was the first English Bible officially authorized for use in the Church of England. Almost done, folks. Other notable English translations include the Geneva Bible of 1560, produced by the Protestant English exiles who escaped Queen Mary I of England and took refuge in Geneva. As an alternative to the Geneva Bible, there was the Bishop's Bible of 1568. What a wonderful history. Summed up in a few paragraphs. When the Protestant Elizabeth I ascended to the English throne, the Catholic exiles created their own English counter-translation called the Rames Douay Bible of 1582, New Testament, and then 1610, Old Testament. Now it's called the Dewey Rames. At that time, it's called the Rames Douay Bible. They finished the English translation, New Testament in 1582, finished the Old Testament in 1610. Notice, this version was finished before the King James. And then we come to, last but not least, it was, however, the 1611 King James Version that became the official, official Bible of the English-speaking world, right? English-speaking world for roughly... The next three centuries, though unbeknownst to many, even the King James Bible has had its edits over the years. Despite its dominance, now notice the shot. The elegant and esteemed King James Version began to fade from usage in the 20th century for two reasons. There you go. That's your history, okay? Now, let me real quickly deal with this canard that I used to also use because I misunderstood Notice that people were being persecuted and sadly, unfortunately, killed for producing Bibles in the vernacular, meaning the language of the people. And this is used by Protestants to bash the Catholics. I do disagree with murdering people for translating the Bible. And I know Catholics would agree that the Catholic Church, as all churches, Orthodox Church, even the church at the time of the apostles rocked by scandals because you had people who did things in the name of Christ that was wrong. No Catholic would defend every act of the Catholic church. There's no one who would defend every act of their church. Even the churches established by the apostles, you find Paul rebuking many of the churches that he established for falling to heresy, for falling into immorality or being deceived by false teachers. Okay. Now, keep that in mind. I don't think it was right to murder people who wanted to translate the Bible in the vernacular. Vernacular meaning in the language of the people. Now, with that said, why did the Catholic Church ban Bible translations? And why did the Catholic Church have the Bibles locked up in the churches, right? In the cathedrals, monasteries, what have you. Now, when I used to be anti-Catholic, I took that as a, a proof that the Catholic Church was evil and wanted to keep people from the Bible. Well, after God softened my heart to really understand the issue, here's the reasons. Are you ready? So we can begin. Now, guys, I didn't waste your time. This background and foundation, very important when dealing with Mormonism. Very important. So I wasn't wasting your time. This is related to the topic. This is why it's going to be a series. Number one, the reason why it's locked up, so people wouldn't steal the Bible. That's number one. 
So people wouldn't steal the Bible because remember, there was no printing press. To make copies of the Bible was very lengthy and expensive and took years. That's number one. Number two, people could go and read that Bible for themselves in the church because it's locked up right there and you can go and read it, open it up. So it's not like they didn't have access to it. But number three, and this is very important, and the Protestant movement proved this point, even to the chagrin of Martin Luther. What the clergy was afraid of was that if the Bible fell in the hands of the uninitiated, those not qualified to understand the Bible and interpret it, then they would run with their misinterpretation and create heresies and schisms. To safeguard from that, the Bible was kept in the church, which people could then read, but also kept in the church so that the qualified shepherds could then interpret Scripture clearly and accurately, lest people read verses out of context, thereby producing heresies and schisms. And that's what you find today, don't you? Were they wrong or were they right for having this fear that the Bible in the hands of the uninitiated the Bible in wrong hands becomes a weapon used by Satan. And if you deny that, the very fact that I'm having series on Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons and other cults is the very proof of why the Bible cannot just be read by anyone. So, no, it wasn't pernicious. It wasn't diabolical. The intention of trying to not to put the Bible in the hands of the masses because now anyone and his mother can go get an English translation of the Bible and everyone and his mother think he or she is the Pope and their interpretation is right and the interpretation of others are wrong. Let's be honest. Is that not what we say? See, you go to a Bible study where you have a group of people who don't know scripture and each one telling you what he thinks the passage means. Well, what do you think it means? Well, I think it means this. Well, I think it means this. Well, I think you're wrong. Right? Thank you, Dinah, Dinah Reviews. I see so many people, so many use the Bible to beat people over the head. God have mercy and help us all. Right? So that's the point. No, Andreas, the Bible doesn't explain itself because the Bible doesn't come and talk to you in an audible voice and say, hey, Andreas, that verse tied in with this verse, and this verse needs to then go with that verse, and this is how you understand it. When we say the Bible is self-interpreting, meaning in the hands of someone qualified, train a man approved of God, knowing how to rightly divide the word of truth, then the Bible interprets itself to that person who knows to use it lawfully. That's what it means. But when you say the Bible interprets itself, unless the Bible speaks to you in an audible voice, and then we'd have to get you some serious psychological, psychiatric therapy, the Bible doesn't say, hey, Andreas, John 1, 1, turn now to Revelation 19, and then go to Exodus, and then bring it together. This is what it means. Did you get the interpretation? All right, good night. Okay, when we say the Bible is self-interpreting, what that means is when the Bible is in the hands of a qualified person, a man or woman who rightly divides the word of truth, who's attained a level of, a level of spiritual maturity <clears throat> and knows how to interpret context, then that individual is able to find all he or she needs in the scriptures to come to accurate doctrines and correct inferences. You, you get my point? Exactly, Pedro. That's why apostolic secession was a big deal. Because John appointed Polycarp, because John spent time with Polycarp, laid hands on him, and saw Polycarp was filled with the Spirit, knew the faith, lived the faith, loved Jesus, and said, now you teach. And then Polycarp appointed Irenaeus, his disciple, 
And he goes, now you become the bishop of France. And then Irenaeus, that's how it worked. 2 Timothy 1, verses 13 and 14. 2 Timothy 2, verses 1 to 2. That's how it worked. Okay, everyone got it? Now we begin with Mormonism. Are we ready? This is part one of an ongoing series with your prayers for me. Pray God grant my daughters and I divine, miraculous, supernatural, physical health. I stay healthy. Protection, the Lord protects us. <clears throat> and salvation, that they know the Lord, fall in love with Jesus, and that I truly obey the Lord Jesus and provision. Let's begin. Let's begin. What do Mormons believe? Okay, here you go. You ready? You're going to get shocked. I'm not going to read snippets, and then Lord willing, if I don't have time in part one, in part two, I'll refute their assertions from Scripture. <clears throat> I'll refute their assertions from Scripture. If not here, part two I will, because this required I do a lot of explaining, lay the groundwork, give you the background information, okay? But I'm just going to read and get astonished. Okay, you're gonna. Uh, I'm laughing because when I read this, I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. This was published by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints, Saint Salt Lake City, Utah. What year? 2002. And I'm shocked that they still put this in print. So let's go. Are you ready? <laughs> Our life in heaven. You guys ready? You guys are ready to be shocked. You thought Islam was bad in its view of Allah and Jesus and Mary and Jannah, paradise, and Nar. You guys ready? I'm, I can't stop laughing because it's so stupid. Here you go. Our life in heaven, chapter 2. <laughs> Our life in heaven, dude. Okay, watch this. Are you ready? Okay. Where did we live? Where did we live before we were born on this earth? What did we do there? Did you catch it? Mormons believe that all of us are spirit children of Elohim and his wife. And we were living as spirits before sent to the world to become flesh so we can be gods and goddesses. Each of us, here it is, each of us, so you know I'm not lying. Okay, page five. Each of us is a child of our Father in heaven. Okay. Before we were born on this earth, we lived in heaven. Our home in heaven was more wonderful and beautiful than anything we know on earth. <clears throat> we belonged to a family there. <laughs> we loved each other and were happy. Our Father in heaven was the Father of our spirits. And for this reason, we often call him Heavenly Father. Because he is our Father. He loves us and cares about us. Okay, watch here. Every person who lives on this earth was our brother or sister in heaven. The oldest child in our heavenly family was Jesus Christ. He's our oldest brother. Now understand what you're reading because it's going to get clear as we unpack. Jesus was born from the union between our Heavenly Father and His wife. So Jesus came into being, and He's the oldest spirit child of Elohim, our Father. And Satan is, is His brother, and you're gonna, it's going to be mentioned here. I'm going to read to you where it says Satan is His brother, and that Jesus and Satan are our brothers. Get ready. Okay. When we lived in heaven, we did not have bodies of flesh and bones like the ones we now have. Watch this. We were spirits. A spirit has the same form as a person. As spirits, we were able to talk to each other, move about, make choices, and know the differences between good and evil. We were not all alike in heaven. <clears throat> we were different just as we are now. We had different desires and abilities. We learn to use our abilities in different ways. Our Father in Heaven knew we could become like Him. Now, remember that. Our Father in Heaven knew we could become like Him. Remember this part? You guys got to really pay attention. If you don't, you're going to miss it. It says, when we lived in Heaven, we did not have bodies of flesh and bones like the ones we now have. Okay? 
But our Father in Heaven knew we could be like Him. Why? Because their belief, God the Father, was a man who had flesh and bones, and He became God and had children, and we, His spirit children, are sent to the world so we can have flesh and bones and then be raised with flesh and bones so we can be gods and goddesses if we go through the rituals, much of which is anchored in masonry, so that we can be like him. You get it? Okay. Since our father in heaven is the father of our spirits, he knew us very well. He loved us. He knew we had received from him the ability to learn and interestingly, all these spirit beings are white. And their drawings, these spirit beings are all white dudes. White chicks and white dudes. Right? Ain't that interesting? When they depict spirit beings in heaven, so far what I've seen, I may have missed it, they're all white people. Right? That means you white people are much closer to becoming gods and goddesses than us dark-skinned folks. Like Coco here. Coco, you're ready to be a goddess. Okay? Get ready. All right. Yeah, white privilege. You got it. Right? So he knew. Watch here. Look what it says. He knew we had received from him the ability to learn the things he knows and to become like him. He wants us always to be good as he is. He wants to help us improve our ability to become like him. Now watch. Our Father in heaven made a plan to help us. Made a plan to help us. Okay. Watch here. In heaven, we learned many things and improved ourselves as much as we could. But there were things we could not learn and do there. Our Father in heaven made a plan for us to learn more. He called us to a meeting. In heaven, we were all there. So Sargon D was there. I was there. Adrian was there. Jedediah was there. Coco was, we were all there in this meeting. Yeah, daddy. I just want to call all my children to a meeting. Okay, daddy. What is it, daddy? Oh, wow. What a great idea, dad. Yeah, Pedro, they're going to explain why you don't remember. Watch here. He explained his plan. To help us to learn and told us that if we followed his plan, we would become like him. Our father in heaven said he would have an earth made, not created from nothing, but fashion, basically, on which we would live for a time. On the earth, we would not remember our life with him in heaven. In your face, Pedro. How do you feel? You got pwned, sucker. They already knew you're going to ask that question. Well, if I was there, how come I can't remember? Because our father, Daddy Dearest, made sure that when we came to earth, we'd forget, sucka. We would forget, sucka. See, our daddy got it all covered, brah. Daddy Dearest got all the bases covered, homie. Homie, don't play that. Right? So we would not remember. We would be able to choose good things okay, or bad things. This would be a test to see if we would obey our Father in heaven when we were not with him. According to our Father in heaven's plan, we would each receive a body of flesh and bones. We would need this kind of body to learn the things he knows and do the things he does. Did you catch it? Why would I need a body of flesh and bones to learn the things that the Father knows? Why? Oh, because the father was a man of flesh and bones too. And they're going to make it explicit in a minute. Later, we would die and our spirits would leave our bodies of flesh and bones. But our spirits would be joined again with our bodies and we would never die again. Those who had done the things that our father in heaven told us to do will return to live with him forever. We learned that everyone would have problems on earth, such as sickness, pain, sorrow, and death. But we understood that we would learn from these things. These problems could teach us to love and help one another. Our Father in heaven would choose the time and the place for each of us to be born on earth. He knew where on earth to send each of us to learn the things that we need to know. 
we would all have opportunities to do many different things. Our Father in heaven wanted us to do good, good things, and be able to return to him. However, he would never force us to do anything. Now watch here. Some of us would choose to obey him. <clears throat> if we did obey him, we would become more like him and return to live with him. Some of us would choose not to obey him. If we did not obey him, we would not be able to become like him and would not be able to re return to live with him. When we heard our Father in heaven's plan for us, we were very happy. Yay, I'm giddy, Daddy. We wanted to be able to learn and develop. Everyone who's lived on earth agreed to live by his plan. Now, let me put some holes in this automatically. Okay. Why in the world would a bunch of spirit children be happy with this plan? Now, if I was there, <laughs> like they say I was, and daddy said, uh, hey, uh, I want you all to be like me. So you got to have bodies and flesh and bones to be like me and learn like me. But here's the problem. Some of you are going to obey. Some of you won't. So I'd, I'd be the first to say, uh, uh, Daddy, yeah, yes, yeah, son. So you're saying there's a chance when I go to the earth, I'm not going to remember that I was here with you, right? Yes, yeah, son. And there's a chance that I'm going to disobey you, right? Yeah. And screw things up for me. Yeah. And somehow you think that's a good plan and we all should be giddy about it. Hip, hip, hooray. No, thank you. I'm fine right here. I have no interest in having a bones, body of flesh and bones. I'm okay being a spirit, Daddy, right? Who would be that stupid? Exactly, young. That's why I have dark skin, sir. Who would be that stupid to agree with such a plan? So let me get this right. Hold on. Let me, let me figure this out. You're telling me I'm here living in perfect bliss. I'm happy as can be, as a spirit, and you're my daddy, and that's mommy over there. I don't know how you get her knocked up, because we're going to talk about that as well in a minute. Okay. You're saying I can risk this all by going to heaven to take a body of flesh and bones and fail to obey you and lose being resurrected in the body of flesh and bones and get demoted? <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> you know what? You can keep that plan. You guys got it? Sorry, man. My, my, my screen is acting up, so pray for the connection. All right, but hold on. Everyone else was giddy. Not me. That's why I'm dark-skinned, like Ian said. You were right, buddy. That was my punishment for talking back. Okay. okay, now, watch here now. This is now page 10. Now, I read page 9. Let's read page 10. Look, what a beautiful, white-looking Jesus. What a beautiful white looking Jesus, right? Okay, so watch here. Sorry, my screen is a little blurry, guys. I, there's not much I can do about it. As long as the audio quality is good, okay? Our oldest brother, Jesus, asked our father in heaven to send him. So our oldest brother Jesus uh, said, uh, Daddy, yeah. And by the way, according to Mormon theology, the father's name is Elohim. I'm sorry, I skipped the uh, page. I'm sorry. I'm going to go back to page nine. That was page seven. I'm sorry. I was reading page seven. I'm going to read page nine. Our father's name is Elohim. Jesus' name is Jehovah. He's Yahweh. He's Jehovah. He became Jesus when he took on a body of bones, right? Flesh and bones. So chapter three, our savior. Let's read this part. I'm sorry, I skipped. Okay. Who is the one person who can guide us back to our father in heaven? Why should we follow him? Who is he and why should we follow him? Okay. Why should we follow him? Okay. We need a leader. Our father in heaven knew that while we were on earth, we would not remember our life with him. Okay. We would not know the things we needed to do to return to him. Oh, that was a great plan, daddy. So we are not going to remember our life with you and we won't know how to get back to you and do the things so we can be exalted like you. What a wonderful plan, daddy. Man, sign me up. All right, now anyway. We would not know the things we needed to do to return to him. He also knew we would sin. 
and everyone was giddy about this plan, guys. Ain't that amazing? It says we're all happy with this plan. <laughs> hey, we're going to forget that we we're spirit children. We're going to forget that we were here with you. We're going to forget what we need to do to get back, and we're going to sin. Woohoo! What a plan. Let's party. <laughs> all right, let's go on. Okay, you ready? Because of our sins, we would be punished by being separated from him forever. And when we die, we would not have our bodies of flesh and bones anymore. What a beautiful plan. We would need someone to help us with these problems. This person would teach us what we would have to do to return to our father in heaven. Okay. He would help us overcome the wrong things we would do. He would also make a way for us to have our bodies of flesh and bones again after we die. This person would be called our savior. <clears throat> Only he could save us from the punishment for the things we could do wrong. Only he could help us learn to be obedient to our father in heaven. Only he could make it possible for us to have our bodies of flesh and bones again after death. Our father in heaven chose Jesus to be our savior. Okay, Our Father in Heaven loves us, and He knew we would need help. He knew we would be very sad if we could not have bodies of flesh and bones. <laughs> Daddy, I don't want to just be a spirit. I want to risk having a body of flesh and bones and perhaps sin and die and not be raised with a body of flesh and bones, but I want to take that risk instead of being here happy as can be, Daddy. Right? So... Let's continue. He knew we, he, we'd be very sad if we could not have bodies of flesh and bones and could not return to live with him forever. We needed someone to help us. Our Father in heaven wanted someone to be our Savior. Two of our brothers. Did you catch it? Two of our brothers offered to be our Savior. Two of our brothers. Guess which two, guys? Two of our brothers offered to be our savior. So which two brothers of ours offered to be our savior? Let's go. Our oldest brother, Jesus. By the way, can you hear my sound? Because I don't know. Again, Satan's upset. Father, Son, and Spirit, in Jesus' name. By the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Bless the quality, sound, and visual. Yeah, and I'm Shifa, Father, Son, and Spirit, in Jesus' almighty name. Is it okay, guys? Because I want to wait. Because, again, it's acting up. I don't know why. Right? Okay, sound is fine? All right. Our oldest brother, Jesus, asked our Father in Heaven to send him. He said he would follow our Father in Heaven's plan. He would come to the earth and teach us the things that we would need to do to return to our Father in Heaven. He would die to pay for the wrong things we did. He would also make it possible for us to live again after we die. He would allow us to choose for ourselves to obey or not to obey our Father in heaven. That's his plan. Watch here now. Jesus knew that it would be important for us to choose for ourselves the things we would do. If someone forced us to obey, we could not learn and become like our Father in heaven. <clears throat> Jesus wanted our Father in heaven to have all the glory and honor. Now here's the second one. Satan, our two brothers, who volunteered to be our saviors. One is Jesus, our oldest brother. The other is Satan. Not making it up. Who was called Lucifer. Also asked our father in heaven to choose him to be our savior. He said he would come to earth and force us to do what we should do. He said that none of us would be lost. He would not allow us to choose for ourselves. As his reward, he wanted all the glory and honor our Father in Heaven had. Because our Father in Heaven loves us, he chose Jesus to be our Savior. For this reason, Jesus is often called Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Christ means chosen by our Father in Heaven to be the Savior. Doesn't mean that, but that's okay. Our Father in Heaven chose Jesus rather than Satan because our Father in Heaven did not want us to lose our right to choose for ourselves he knew we must do good things because we want to, not because someone forces us to. So, guys, your two brothers, your oldest brother, Jesus, and your older brother, Satan, 
went to daddy and said, daddy, I'll save them. And daddy said to Jesus, how are you going to do it, Jesus? I will show them the way and I'll die for their sins. So if they believe me and follow my way, they'll be raised in bodies of flesh and bones and become like us. But I won't force them to do your will. Satan says, ooh, 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 ooh. What is it, Lucifer? What is it, Lucy? I will force them to obey you, force them to do good, so that all of them will be raised in bodies of flesh and bones. But you got to give me the credit, Daddy, and I'll lose none of them. Ooh, ooh choose me. Ooh, 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 ooh. And then what did Daddy say to Lucy? What did Daddy say to Lucy? Now, now, Lucy, that's not the way you should treat your siblings. You can't make your brothers and sisters do something against their will. Now, now, I think I'm going to go with your older brother, Yahweh. Yahweh, who's going to be known as Jesus, I like his idea. Okay, Lucy? Now, here's what's ironic. I didn't know that Satan had a Latin name. Because you see what it says here? It says, Satan who was called Lucifer. Who was called Lucifer. No, it's not buffering Anna, you little hater. Satan was called Lucifer. Lucifer is the Latin translation of Isaiah 14, verse 12. Okay, you guys listening? Lucifer is the Latin translation of Isaiah 14, 12. Lucifer is not Hebrew, it's Latin. In Isaiah 14, 12, the word there is Halel, shining one, which in Latin was translated Lucifer. I did not know that Satan had a Latin name before the world was made and before there were human languages. I didn't know that, guys. This was news to me. Thanks to Joseph Smith and the Church of Jesus Christ, of Latter-day Weirdos, now I knew that the proper name of Satan was Lucifer and the Hebrew was a translation of Lucifer. It wasn't that the name is Halel, and that's assuming it's about Satan, not Nebuchadnezzar. It's really his name is Lucifer, but when they wrote it in Hebrew, they went with the Hebrew version of his name, Lucifer. So guys, Latin was a language spoken at least by our heavenly daddy to Satan, because he gave him a Latin name, Lucifer, Luciferos, Lucy, Lucy Goosey. Okay, so what happens now, guys? Hopefully, Father, Holy Spirit, I pray the buffering goes away. Please, my God, as long as the audio is good. Okay, let's go. Let's read on page. Page this now. Page eleven. Jesus is our Lord, our Savior and leader. When our Father in heaven chose Jesus, Satan became very angry. He persuaded one-third of the spirits in heaven to follow him. Together, they fought against Jesus and his followers. Now, guys, understand what it's saying here. Lucifer got upset, so he led one-third of the spirits in heaven to follow him. Together they fought against Jesus and his followers. They wanted to force our Father in heaven to accept Satan's plan. Our Father in heaven made Satan and his followers leave heaven. Satan and his followers will not receive bodies of flesh and bones. They will not be able to return and live with our Father in heaven. Only those who accepted Jesus to be their Savior can have bodies of flesh and bones. We know because we have bodies of flesh and bones that we accepted Jesus to be our Savior. Did you guys catch it? We chose the right things in heaven. We should continue to choose the right things here on earth. Now, let me explain what that means. Satan chose a third of the spirit sons and daughters of Elohim to agree with him to overthrow Jesus and his plan and force our Heavenly Father to accept his plan. The Heavenly Father got upset, banished Satan and a third of his spirit sons and daughters from heaven, and they will never be allowed to be born, to have bodies and flesh and bones. They're going to remain as spirits, whereas all of us 
who are born bodies of flesh and bones means that during that battle, that war, we took Jesus aside against Satan's side because if he had taken Satan's side, we would not be here in flesh. Do you understand what you just read? The reason why I'm in the flesh, you're in the flesh, we agreed with Jesus's plan and we accepted Jesus's plan in agreement with our Heavenly Father over against Satan because those who agreed with Satan over against Jesus and our Heavenly Father, the Heavenly Father banished Satan and those spirits never to come in the flesh but remain spirits forever. So the fact that you're in the flesh means you agreed with that plan. You accepted Jesus to be your Savior, not Lucifer. So the demons that are roaming the earth, they're not angels. They're actually spirits that would have been humans. So in a sense, they're angels. But in a sense, who are angels? All the spirit children of Heavenly Father that he sired with his heavenly wife. See how it works? You see the logic? So Linda and Buntoro and Coco and Edwin and I and all of you, the reason why we're in the flesh is because we agreed to accept Jesus as our Savior. We agreed with Heavenly Father that Jesus' plan is best and much superior and better than Satan's plan. So we went with Jesus being our Savior over against Lucifer because if we agreed with Satan, we would not be in the flesh right now. We would be roaming the earth as spirits with Satan terrorizing human beings. Don't you love this religion? You thought Islam was stupid. Okay. You got it so far? Yep, Linda, you're on the right side. Yep, Adrian, you chose, you made the good choice. Or you wouldn't be in the flesh. So let's finish this section because now you're going to see something more disturbing in a minute. Continue on page 12. So I'm reading from the book. I'm not making it up. We should follow Jesus. Only he can teach us how to return to our Father in heaven. He can help us overcome the wrong things we do and help us learn to do good things until we become like our Father in heaven. Okay? <clears throat> Our Father in heaven wants us to follow and obey Jesus. He knows that Jesus will always teach us our Father's way of doing things. So when we obey Jesus, we are also obeying our Father in heaven. A commandment or message from Jesus is a commandment or message from our Father in heaven also. Now that was chapter 3. Let me skip to chapter 5, part 2, leaving... The presence of God. Notice again, they're white dudes. Adam and Eve are white dudes. What's up with Adam and Eve being white? What is this, man? This is supposed to be Adam and Eve, guys. When we chose to leave the presence of God, Adam and Eve, these spirit sons of God, took on flesh that Yahweh, Jehovah Jesus, made for them. Right? But they're white. What is, what's up with this, dude? They're all white here, man. What the heck, man? Dude. What the heck? Now, this is the part I want to read. Okay? And then we're going to stop here and maybe try to respond to some of this nonsense. Okay? Here it is. Chapter 5, Jesus made the earth. Jesus made the earth. Okay? Watch here. Let's see who's going to pick it up. <clears throat> Who made the earth? Why did he make it? We needed an earth. Part of the plan that our Father in heaven explained to us in heaven was for us to leave heaven for a time. <clears throat> we needed a place to go away from his presence to receive bodies of flesh and bones and to be tested to show whether we would make correct choices. He needed to have someone make this place for us. He chose Jesus to do it. <clears throat> Jesus made the earth. Jesus made the earth. He made the day and the night. He made the sun, the moon, and the stars. He separated the water from the dry land and made seas, lakes, and rivers. He planted grass, trees, flowers, 
and all other kinds of plants on the earth. <clears throat> then he put animals, fish, birds, and insects on the earth. When Jesus had done all this, the earth was ready for people to live on it. Now, here is the blasphemy. Are you ready? You guys ready? <clears throat> Page 19 of this book. You can get it from Deseret Bookstores. It's a Mormon bookstore. Boy, are the Mormons going to get upset at me. You ready? Our Father in heaven then made a man and woman. The man was named Adam. The woman was named Eve. Do you see the underline? Let's see if you see the underline. Can you see it, the underline? They each had a body of flesh and bones like the body of our Father in heaven. Fix your eyes on that. They each had a body of flesh and bones like the body of our Father in heaven. The Father in heaven has a body of flesh and bones, which is why he sent us so we can have bodies of flesh and bones like him. So like him, we can become gods and goddesses. What page? Page 19. You caught it? In Mormon theology, let me repeat. In Mormon theology, God the Father isn't the original God. He was a man who became God <clears throat> and still has his body of flesh and bones, albeit glorified. And Jesus has a body of flesh and bones. Now, the only one that doesn't have a body of flesh and bones yet is the Holy Spirit. But in Mormon theology, they speculate. They go, it may be in the future that the Holy Spirit will also take on a body of flesh and bones. We don't know. So they're silent about the matter. <clears throat> so to them, Father, Son, and Spirit are not one God. They're three gods who are united. And in that union, they can be considered one God, but they're not really one God. Right? It's their unity and agreement that you can then reckon them as one God. The Father's Elohim, who sired, gave birth to Yahweh, who is Jesus. And Elohim and Yahweh, Jesus, have bodies of flesh and bones. And the Holy Spirit is a personage, but he doesn't have flesh and bones yet. So I asked the Mormon, so God the Father had a God over him? Yes. <clears throat> a God that exalted him? Yes. How many gods are there? And do you know who the original God is? And the Mormon told me, we don't know. <clears throat> do you know that? Mormonism is polytheism. It's paganism to the max. It's nothing more than poly <clears throat> polytheism, paganism, so that their father is a man of a body of flesh and bones that became a god because he had a god that exalted him. And then the list goes on and on and on because they don't know who the original god is. And because God the Father was a man, he didn't create the universe. He simply, simply refashioned, remade matter but he didn't create it because it already existed. This is what they believe. <clears throat> Everyone got what they believe before I move on? <clears throat> Sorry about that. Pray for me that the Holy Spirit will give me perfect health, especially in my throat. With my dying breath, I glorify Christ. <clears throat> so everyone with me so far before I move on? So Mormonism, when it comes to the view of God, much more wicked, much more blasphemous, much more evil, much more filthy, much more demonic, much more idolatrous than Islam, which is shocking to say that. They are not Christians. They are not your brothers and sisters. They are worse blasphemers than even Mohammedans. And they're more dangerous because at least Hindus don't claim to be Christians and follow the Bible. They claim to be the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. 
So they claim they worship the same Father, the same Jesus, have the same Spirit, because they claim the same faith and even give you the impression that they believe in the Bible. Insofar as it's properly interpreted and translated, obviously by them. This is what they believe, right? Now, let me read some quotes from some of their prophets. Now, thank the Lord for modern technology. Thank the Lord for all these resources that are online for free. All you do is pay for the internet. Now, before I quote the online resources, let me watch this. And by the way, again, I need to thank you. And I pray God purify my motives. And I mean it from my heart. I really want to thank you. And I ask the Lord Jesus to bless you and reward you because he is your reward and he's my reward. Those of you who keep praying for me, praying for my daughters, especially God, grant us perfect health, protection, safety, salvation, and then the Lord empower me to be self-disciplined, to stay healthy and fit for his glory. Lord, bless you for praying for me. And don't stop praying for me and my daughters because we'll always be in need your prayers. And I want to thank you guys who support the ministry financially. You don't know how much of a blessing you are, especially as it gets harder financially and people panic. Many of you have still remained faithful in giving, and the Lord bless you. He is your reward and my reward, because if it wasn't for you supporting ministry, I can't get these resources. You know how expensive this is? Look, 35 bucks, man. So why do I buy it? So that I can seek the face of the Holy Spirit to train me to go through their sources, to then equip you to destroy these wicked, filthy, blasphemous, satanic religions. So thank you, guys. The Lord bless you, and the Lord keep us humble and teachable. And in love with Jesus Christ. Now, this is their study guide in the Old Testament. So if you're a Mormon, you're going to pick up this volume. <clears throat> this volume. <laughs> I like what Kitty Lason said. Wow, 35 books. That's like two Starbucks coffee. And by the way, I know there are coffee shops, restaurants, supermarkets that do support financially the LGBTQ agenda and homosexuality and, a, and also Planned Parenthood. There's nothing we can do about it. But one thing we can do, <clears throat> I just found out from Bill O'Reilly that Starbucks not only supports Planned Parenthood, but Starbucks has even said that if they have an employee who wants to get an abortion, they'll pay for it. That if they have an employee that wants to get an abor abortion, they will pay for the abortion. Folks, we need to show we are not going to tolerate a coffee place paying for a woman to murder an unborn child, an innocent life, shedding blood, avoid, boy boycott Starbucks, take their coffee, flush it down the toilet. Do not support them anymore, any more than you would Disney. And let's practice what we preach. Let us at least do what we can for the life of the unborn child because life begins at conception according to the life giver, okay? And we keep praying in Jesus' name. One of the reasons why judgment is being unleashed on America is because God hates the shedding of innocent blood, murdering innocent blood, and unborn children are innocent in his eyes and loved of the Lord. Okay. Now, with that said, let me go to this section. Okay. This section right here. Watch here. Okay. This is what Mormons are taught if they read this. Yep. Let's practice what we preach and pray for me not to be a hypocrite to obey you, Lord, and love you. Watch here. Here's their section on Genesis. Okay. Look what they say about the creation. Genesis. You ready? Let me find it. Chapter 1. This is page 7, guys. Page. Let me underline it. Let me underline it. Page 7. From their own sources, folks. Page 7. Yeah. Oh, boy, this is funny. I don't know if I should laugh or I should cry. Let me underline it so you can see it. I don't know if I should laugh or I should cry. Okay. Let me get there. Okay, here you go. Here you go, right here, page 7, where it says here, God created this earth and 
it's heaven and all forms of life in six days. The creative acts of each day are described. God creates man, both male and female, in his own image. Man is given dominion over all things and is commanded to multiply and fill the earth. In the beginning, God created the heavens, the heaven, the King James is heaven, and the earth. Now they have notes at the bottom, right? Notes at the bottom. They have notes at the bottom, and they have commentary to the side. Now watch. Do you see where I underline right there to the side, right here, page seven? Do you see it? Can you read what it says? Look. Let me show it to you. Hold on. Okay. What occurred in the beginning? Joseph Smith taught in the beginning the head of the gods called the Council of the Gods and concocted, prepared a plan to create the world and people, people it. Joseph Smith Papers History, 1838-1856, Volume E, and I believe it says 17. Did you hear it? Volume E1, 1 July, 1843-30. The father directed his son to create the earth. See, Moses, 132, that's in the Book of Mormon, JST. Speaking to some of the noble and great ones who were with him, the Lord declared, we will go down and we will take of these materials and we will make an earth where on these the father's spirit children may dwell and we will prove them herewith to see if they will do all things whatsoever the lord their god shall command them abraham 3 22 24 25 did you hear it in other words the gods headed by jesus the great ones headed by jesus came down and took the material that was already existing and refashion and reorganized it. Okay? Now read that part again. Speaking to some of the noble and great ones, right? The Lord declared, we will go down. So Jesus is coming down with some others. And we will take of these material. So the material was there already. And we will make an earth. So we're going to fashion the earth from this material that already exists. Where on these, the Father, Spirit, children may dwell, and we will prove them herewith to see if they will do all things whatsoever the Lord their God shall command them. See that? So, and what's the quoting from? Book of Abraham, chapter 3, verse 22, 24 to 25. This is what Mormonism teaches, and I just gave it to you from their own source, their resources. I'm just underlining it, right? So you guys don't think I'm making it up, right? Okay. So you caught it? In the beginning, the head of the gods. Here, I'm going to let you see it. I got underlined it all. Right to your left. Do you see it? You see it so you can look at it? Am I making it up? Do you see it? So take a moment to read it. There you go. This is Mormonism. Does that sound Christian to you? Does this sound like it's a Christian religion to you guys? All right. Okay. Now let me read. Here it is. Let me get you the links. Journal of Discourses Online. Journal of Discourses Online. Okay. Let me see. Let me what I'm reading. Okay. Let me just get the quote. Here you go. Journal of Discourses Online. Let me see. This comes from July 8, 1860. July 8, 1860. Remarks by President Brigham Young made in the Bowery, Great Salt Lake City, July 8, 1860. Here it is. Here's the link. Okay, guys. Here's the link. I hope you're learning a lot. There's the link. Click on it. It's online. Let's read what he says about the birth of our Lord, okay? Let's go here. <clears throat> Watch here, folks. Let's see what he says about the birth of our Lord. And I quote, While Brother Joseph was referring to the providences of God, I was led to reflect that there is no act, no principle, no power belonging to the deity that is not purely philosophical. Watch here about the birth of our Lord. 
the birth of the Savior was as natural as the births of our children. It was the result of natural action. He partook of flesh and blood, was begotten of his father as we were of our fathers. Do you understand the implication of what I just read? You understand what I just read the implication of it? Here it is. This is Brigham Young, one of their other prophets. Here it is. Let me, re let me read it again. The birth of the Savior was as natural as are the births of our children. It was the result of natural action. He partook of flesh and blood, was begotten of his father as we were of our fathers. Now remember, God their father has a body of flesh and bones. Remember, he's got a body, a physical body, flesh and bones. So being a glorified, exalted, deified man, of course, he can sire children, procreate children like humans do, because he's us, but on a glorified level. You guys caught it? This is Mormonism. Okay. I'm going to give you something else. Hold on. Okay, now here's another one. Here's another one. This one here. Okay, this is from, let's see, April 9, 1852, Journal of Discourses Online. I'm going to give you the link again. A sermon by President Brigham Young. Notice the name, Brigham Young. Bring them young, like Momo. Delivered in the tabernacle, Great Salt Lake City, April 9, 1852. Here's the link. Right, Journal of Discourses online, right? It's online here, and this says it's volume one. The other one that I read from, right, didn't give a volume. But anyway, here it goes. So you can read online. Here's the link, folks, right there. And I'll try to put the links in the description box for those of you who come later. Let me read this to see what he says here, okay? Watch here, guys. Let me start from this. There's two paragraphs I'm going to read. Let me see how many up. I'm going to read two. Okay, watch her. Let me read this. My next sermon will be both saint and sinner. Okay. One thing has remained a mystery in this kingdom up to this day. It is regard to the character of the well-beloved son of God, upon which subject the elders of Israel have conflicting views. Our God and father in heaven is a being of tabernacle. Or in other words, he has a body. With the parts the same as you and I have. Hey now, the weary head. Here's the quote. You got it here? Here it is. So our God and Father, what? Our God and Father, what? What does it say? Did you hear it? In heaven is a being of tabernacle, or in other words, he has a body with parts the same as you and I have. Hey now, weary hair, night and feeling. Did you caught it? You did you see that quote? Okay, let's read. And is capable of showing forth his works to organized beings, as for instance, in the world which we live, it is a result of the knowledge and infinite wisdom that dwell in his organized body. His son, Jesus Christ, has become a personage of tabernacle because he became flesh and has a body like his father. So the father has a physical body. He's a personage of flesh. Jesus then became a personage of flesh. He had a physical body. What about the Holy Spirit? The Holy Ghost is the Spirit of the Lord and issues forth from himself and may properly be called God's minister to execute his will in immensity. Being called to govern by his influence and power. Now watch, guys. But he is not a person of tabernacle. So the Holy Spirit doesn't have a tabernacle, a physical body. As we are, and as our Father in heaven and Jesus Christ are. You guys catching this? From the horse's mouth. Are you learning this, guys? Mormons say the Father has a tabernacle, a body of flesh and bones. Jesus has a tabernacle, tabernacle body of flesh and bones like we do, but the Holy Spirit doesn't. Bring him young. That's what he just said. So let's keep reading. 
The question has been, guys, get ready. And it's often asked, who it was that begat the son of the Virgin Mary? The infidel world, that's not about us Christians, have concluded that if what the apostles wrote about his father and mother be true, and the present marriage discipline acknowledged by Christendom to be correct, then Christians must believe that God is the father of an illegitimate son and the person of Jesus Christ. You got it? Saying if we actually teach what we teach and believe it, then the father is the father of an illegitimate son. Jesus is not his legitimate son. If you accept what the church has historically taught about Jesus' conception. Okay, now let's read. Okay. The infidel fraternity teach that to their disciples, I will tell you how it is. Our Father in heaven begat all the spirits that ever were or ever will be upon this earth, and they were born spirits in the eternal word, world. Then the Lord by his power and wisdom organized the mortal tabernacle of man. We were made for spiritual and afterwards temporal. Now watch here, guys. Okay. Now hear it, O inhabitants of the earth. Hear, because Brigham Young is a prophet, Jew and Gentile, saint and sinner. When our father Adam came into the Garden of Eden, he came into it with a celestial body and brought Eve, one of his wives, with him. So he has more than one wife? Hold on. Adam came with a celestial body, meaning the heavenly body, and brought only one of his wives, Eve. So he has other wives. He, Adam, helped to make and organize the world. He is Michael, the archangel, the ancient of days. Did that, did that settle in? Or no, you didn't get it? You hear what Brigham Young just taught? Adam was actually Michael. Adam was actually the ancient of days. Adam had many wives. Eve was one of them. Here it is. Let me get you the link again. I'm going to get you the quotes. Save these links, guys. Save these quotes. Okay. He helped Adam to make and organize this world. Why? He is Michael, the archangel, the ancient of days, about whom holy men have written and spoken. He is our father and our God and the only God with whom, with whom we have to do. Here it is. Here's the quote. Here it is, guys. I'm going to post it right now. He helped to make and organize the world. He is Michael, the archangel, the ancient of days, about whom holy men have written and spoken. He is our father and our God and the only God with whom we have to do. So Adam is God the father, our heavenly father. He came with one of his wives into the world that he organized. He is Michael. He is the Ancient of Days. Okay? This is Brigham Young. But wait. Hold on, guys. It's going to get a little worse. Every man upon the earth, professing Christians or non-professing, must hear it and will know it sooner or later. They came here, organized their raw material, and arrange it in their order, the herbs of the field, the trees, the apple, the peach, the plum, the pear, and every other fruit that is desirable and good for man. The seed was brought for, from another sphere and planted in this earth. The thistle, the thorn, the briar, and the obnoxious weed did not appear until after the earth was cursed. Now watch. When Adam and Eve had eaten of the forbidden fruit, their bodies became mortal from its effects, and therefore their offspring were mortal. Now, guys, get ready. It's about Mary, the Blessed Mother, and Jesus. When the Virgin Mary conceived the child Jesus, the Father had begotten him in his own likeness. He was not begotten by the Holy Ghost. He was not begotten by the Holy Ghost. There you go. Quote, Brigham Young. Right there. When the Virgin Mary conceived the child Jesus, the Father had begotten him in his own likeness. He was not 
begotten by the Holy Ghost. Then who begot him? Okay. And who is the father? He is the first of the human family. Adam. That's what it is. And I'm saying Adam. Who's the father? The first of the human family. And when he took a tabernacle, it was begotten by his father in heaven. Okay. Now it seems like Adam is not the father, but earlier Adam came with a celestial body with one of his wives, and he's the ancient days, and Michael, and the only God with whom we have. So it, this may be that other God that exalted him, who had a God over him, and on and on it goes. Uh-oh, but now watch. Watch mm -hmm. here. After the same manner as the tabernacles of Cain and Abel, and the rest of the sons and daughters of Adam and Eve from the fruits of the earth, the first earthly tabernacles were originated by the Father, and so on in succession. I could tell you much more about this, but were I to tell you the whole truth, blasphemy would be nothing to it. And the estimation of the superstitious and overrighteous of mankind. So he's saying, if I told you everything, then you would consider me blasphemous because of the stupid superstitious beliefs you guys hold. However, I have told you the truth as far as I have gone. I have heard men preach upon the divinity of Christ and exhaust all the wisdom they possess. All scripturalists and approved theologians who are considered exemplary for piety and education have undertaken to expound on this subject in every age of the Christian era. And after they have done all, they're obliged to conclude by exclaiming, a great is the mystery of godliness and tell nothing. See, they say it's great, this mystery. It's beyond our comprehension and say nothing. So he adds, because he is a prophet. Final paragraph. It is true that the earth was organized by three distinct characters, namely Elohim, Yehovah, and Michael, these three forming a quorum as in all heavenly bodies and an organizing element perfectly represented in the deity as Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. So now tell me you're not confused like me. So now are you saying Michael is Holy Ghost? Or does the Father, Son, Holy Ghost, right, <clears throat> represent... Elohim, Yahovah, Michael, or Elohim, Yahovah, Michael, represent Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Okay? Let me read one more paragraph. One more, and then we'll stop. I mean, there's a lot, but let me read this one. I have given you... Let me read these two, sorry. Again, they will try to tell how the divinity of Jesus is joined in his humanity, that he's divine and human and exhaust all their mental faculties and wind up with this profound language as describing the soul of man. It is an immaterial substance. What a learned ideal Jesus, our elder brother, was begotten in the flesh by the same character that was in the Garden of Eden. Did you catch it? And who is our father in heaven? Did you catch it? Who begot him? This is Brigham Young online discourse, journal of discourses. And I'm going to post, post the link in the description box. Did you hear what he just said? What a learned ideal, Jesus, our elder brother, was begotten in the flesh by the same character that was in the Garden of Eden and who is our Father in heaven. So did you see who begot him? Adam came with a celestial body with one of his wives. Adam is the Ancient of Days. He is our God and Father, the only God and Father with whom we have to deal with, Michael. And Adam is the one who begot Jesus from Mary, not the Holy Ghost, not the Holy Spirit. Our Father, who is Adam, who is the only God that we have anything to do with, he begot him from Mary. Why do you think Brigham Young said in the previous <clears throat> quotation from that other journal of discourse that Jesus was begotten by the Father like all men are begotten by their fathers? You understand what's going on here? Everyone getting it? Now let all who may hear these doctrines pause before they make light of them. In other words, pause. Think about it, guys. Don't get reactionary or treat them with indifference, for they will prove their salvation or damnation. You better accept this or you're going to be damned. Final one. There's a lot more, but I'm going to end it here. This paragraph, I have to. I've given you a few leading items upon this subject, but a great deal more remains to be told. Now remember from this time forth, you heretic. Trinitarians, remember this, and forever, keep this in mind, that Jesus Christ was not begotten by the Holy Ghost. What does this prophet want you to remember? What does he want you to believe? 
Okay, here you go. Okay. Now, remember from this time, forth and forever, that Jesus Christ was not begotten by the Holy Ghost. I'll repeat a little anecdote. I was in conversation with a certain learned professor upon this subject. When I replied to this idea, if the Son was begotten by the Holy Ghost, it would be very dangerous to baptize and confirm females and give the Holy Ghost to them, lest he should beget children to be palmed upon the elders by the people, bringing the elders into great difficulties. What a stupid, retarded thing to say. There you go. This is Mormonism. So here's the link again. Now I'm going to sum up what this link says. This is a link trying to deny that God the Father has sex with his wives to sire children. And it's not a denial, more as it is a cautionary <clears throat> exhortation. This comes from fair, faithful answers, informed response. Do Latter-day Saints actually believe in a practice called celestial sex? So here they're trying to address the accusation made by opponents of the Mormon church that since God the Father is a man and he has wives, he has sex with them to sire children. If you read their response, here it is. Let me repeat it again. And I'll put this in the description box. <clears throat> Fair, faithful answers, informed response. Do Latter-day Saints actually believe in a practice called celestial sex? They don't say no. They don't say yes. They admit that spirit beings, spirit bodies, and God the Father having a body of flesh and bones have the quality of sex. But it doesn't mean they engage in sex. And say so they don't come on and say, yeah, God the Father, God is wise pregnant by having sex with them, but they don't deny it. They're pretty much silent because they're agnostic. They're not certain. So they don't say yes. They don't say no. They don't know. Because after all, if God the Father has a body of flesh and bones and he has wives and he gets them pregnant and they give birth to his children, that means he has sex with them. They don't say yes. They don't say no. They're silent because they haven't been given that revelation. But they do admit that God the Father, his wives, and all of these spirit children do have the quality of sex. Not only in gender, but the ability to procreate gender. So there you go, guys. Now, which is worse? When it comes to the Godhead, which group is more blasphemous, more wicked, more filthy, more vile, more satanic in their view of God. Muslims or Mormons? Mormons. And they're more dangerous. Why? Because we know Muslims are not Christians. We know Hindus are not Christians. But Mormons go around saying, Church of Jesus Christ. A latter-day church of Latter-day Saints with another testament of Jesus Christ. And they call Jesus Yahuwah, Jehovah, and the Father Elohim. And they'll tell you that they're one God in their agreement, but they're not really one God. There are three gods, and one is older than the other two. Because God the Father begot, procreated Jehovah, who becomes Jesus from one of his spirit wives, and Satan is another child he procreated so that Jesus and Satan, who's called Lucifer, are brothers. They are much more dangerous, more wicked and evil than Muslims. Be forewarned. They are not Christian. Their church is not Christian. They don't have the real father. They don't have the real Jesus. They don't have the real spirit, the real Mary. They have a satanic counterfeit. More blasphemous than what Islam teaches about God. At least Muslims don't believe Allah has sex with wives to procreate children. We give them that. So I hope that's clear. This will be part one. Lord willing, in subsequent parts, we will go more in depth in refuting their garbage. Now remember, I'm quoting from their official statements and their prophets. 
I will give you the links to the journal of discourses where Brigham Young said the things I quoted in the description box, and I will pin them as a comment. So you have the resources, you have the information, even if you don't know enough to refute them, you now know enough to realize they are not Christians. They're not your brothers and sisters. They're not like the evangelical Protestant Trinitarians who love and worship and adore the true God, who believe the Bible is God's perfect word, who are members of the spiritual household of Christ. They may not have much of the fullness of the truth as the apostolic traditions, but they're there. They're part of the tree. Leaves of the branches from the same tree built in the same root. Mormonism comes from the same rotten root, not fruit, rotten satanic root, satanic core that produced Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, and these other isms. So I hope you learn. I hope you enjoyed it. Praise the triune God. Praise the Father, the Son, the Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit. We had a good crowd. We had about 230. For me, that's good. I'm not Christian prince yet. Thank you for the numbers. Pray we get more serious students who want to learn, not pontificate or argue. Pray we get more subscribers for the glory of Christ, not for my praise or intention. Hit the like button. Take all my articles, all my sessions, upload them, translate them, clip them. Seek the face of the Holy Spirit to understand these facts correctly. Present them accurately so they don't accuse you of misrepresenting. And bathe me in prayer. Cry out to the Lord, Lord God Almighty, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Grant Sam, his daughters, even their, their mother, miraculous, divine, supernatural, physical protection, physical health, that the Lord give me the discipline to control my appetites, to die to lust and, and gluttony, to keep healthy and keep the weight off, to keep my daughters healthy in love with Jesus. Ask the Lord to bring them to me so I can raise them until the Lord comes and I go home before them. And ask the Lord to help me to be more like Jesus, to love like Jesus, and to love Jesus more and love you more, and be faithful to the Lord, and provide for the ministry. Things are getting hard, but thank the Lord so far. It's been steady. People haven't dropped. Pray that stays that way. If the Lord wants me to do ministry, you don't need me. He doesn't need me. We need the Father. We need the Son. We need the Holy Spirit. And because of the Lord, He raises up people to serve the church, and I pray I'm one of them. And for his sake, I love you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, of the Holy Spirit, Abba, have mercy. Son of God, have mercy. Holy Spirit, have mercy. Cleanse, purify, wash us, our loved ones, my daughters, their mother, we beseech you. In the blood of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus, fill us with the Holy Spirit. Fill them with the Holy Spirit. Grant us perfect self-control, self-discipline, self-restraint, to obey and love and worship you. To convince ourselves that we belong to you and love you, not for the praise of men. And Lord, help me to overcome my lust and appetites. Give me the health I need, the discipline I need to glorify you and serve your church. You are worthy. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is alive. The eternal, uncreated, begotten Son of the Father, the love of the Spirit, God in the flesh, our Lord, our love, our life. Keep us in love with you, Lord Jesus, and never allow us to betray you and return sooner than later. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Maranatha. Lord willing, see you sometime this week.